in majesty we will bow in wonder before the lamb and evermore the saints will sing yes evermore the saints will sing
Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes.
Psalm 13, it says, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. God has been so good to us. Let's go ahead and stand as we sing to him this morning. Draw a breath as the dawn awoke, and does your heart still beat? Is the mighty word of the living God upholding you? Then sing, oh sing. Has the Father's love filled your longing heart with grace for every need? Come and lay your burdens at Jesus' feet And find new strength to sing, oh sing Morning and evening, everything breathing must sing Oh sing, all of creation rise up and praise the King of kings and sing. As the Son of God died to take away your sin and set you free, as the conqueror trampled over death, is Christ enthroned in sing, oh sing. Morning and evening, everything breathing must sing, oh sing. All of creation, rise up and praise the King of kings and sing. Final day when the Lord on high returns in majesty. We will bow in wonder before the Lamb, and evermore the saints will sing. Yes, evermore the saints will sing. Morning and evening, everything breathing must sing. Oh, sing, all of creation, rise up and praise the King of kings. Morning and evening, everything breathing must sing. Oh, sing, all of creation, rise up and praise the King of kings and sing. be seated. Good morning. What an amazing song to start with. And uh, if you're visiting us today, welcome to Christ Fellowship. If you're joining us online, welcome as well. Uh, just have a few announcements as we get started here. Um, this is exciting. VBS registration is now open. You can go to our website or Facebook. So I encourage you, parents, to Sign your kids up as early as possible so that we can make the necessary arrangements uh, so we know how many people are coming. And I would also encourage you, please share that on Facebook, social media, so we can get the word out to the community. This will be a great outreach for kids to come and uh, hear the gospel this summer. And so um, also, we have nursery training. So anybody that helps with the infants or toddlers, um, it's for all volunteers, um, and that will be after the service on May 5th. So right after the service, plan on sticking around. And it's a good time just to put it out there. If you would like to serve in that ministry, whether it's in the toddler room or in the nursery, as you know, we have a lot of uh, kids coming or just born, so it's really exciting. So if you're interested in that, um, talk to Carrie Horseman or 
Pastor Marcus, and they could get you in touch uh, with Carrie. So, um, so we, really exciting today. I'm going to ask Ken to come up. We, he has an update on the missions, Matt, and we've been praying about this a long time, and it's really exciting what Ken and his team have come up with, and it's just exciting to talk about how we as a local church are reaching out uh, missions here in the States and around the world. So really excited. Take it away, Ken. Good morning. So uh, this last uh, Monday we had an elder meeting and uh, we presented a, somewhat of a plan to the board for the missions. And uh, the elders by the night said we want you to present that to the congregation just to give, give them updates of what's going on. So our team uh, consists of Tom and Laura Junkmas, Jake and Cheyenne Jardinsky, Aaron and April Holder, and myself and my wife. And uh, we meet uh, a couple times a month. And we've been really working hard this last year to get to know our missionaries. Uh, um, the board supplied us about a year ago with a new document on the elder, I mean, on the missions map. And it's about 25 pages long, all that, what the requirements are to be a missionary for Christ Fellowship and for the mat, uh, how to proceed. And so we've been learning that document as it's uh, pretty intense, as you can imagine with Dr. Steele and Pastor Marcus being a part of writing that thing. So it's pretty intense. And so that's one of the things we've been doing. But what we've really been working hard on is uh, the communicating with our missionaries, trying to get to know them because we've, many of these missionaries have been here for 30, 40, 50 years. And, uh, and so we've been supporting them for that long. So our team is getting to know them, and, and that's been a really good process. What we have found out, though, many of our missionaries are in the retirement status. And so they, they've gotten of that age, and they're now retired. Many of them have, are now stateside. And so what that has done is freed us up to look for new missionaries. And so right now our team is looking at a process of what it looks like to find new missionaries for Christ Fellowship. And that's going to be really exciting because what we get to do is uh, start candidating missionaries and bring them to you guys and, and get the congregation excited about that because we want them to be a part of Christ Fellowship. We want them to be a part of the family. And so we're kind of excited about that. Um, what that also means is uh, it takes a little bit of time to do that. And so that's something you're going to get lots of information on uh, as we get closer to that. We have one couple we're looking at at, at Utah, a family with four kids. And uh, we might be going there in June to talk to them, to look at them. And so that process is already working. Uh, we're looking at possibly two missionaries, one in the States and one outside the States. And uh, that's kind of where we're at with the missions right now. And we're excited about that. Uh, if you're not familiar with our budget, we've increased our budget quite a bit over the last few years. Up, to, I think we got $36,000 in the budget to look for that. And it frees up close to $20,000 to go looking for two missionaries. Okay. So thank you for the budget. Thank you for applying that because it's going to grow each year. And uh, we're excited to see how that grows. Right now, um, one of the things in the missions, Matt, is Camp Gilead. So next Sunday, Camp Gilead is going to be here, uh, Kimberly Mallory. And she's going to be going to all the classrooms. Uh, she's going to be talking to your kids, trying to get them excited and be passionate about that. And uh, she's going to be talking right here in this service also next week. Um, last year, I, taught, I met with uh, Kimberly, and she made a comment that Christ Fellowship at one time was their largest supporting church where we brought busloads of kids down there. She remembers one year where the, our bus wasn't big enough, so we borrowed a second bus, and we had that many kids coming from this church. Well, our mission map wants to get to that point. We want to get that ministry as excited as it was back in those days. And so we're coming to you today. We uh, asked the elders what they thought, and we are going to supply scholarships for every one of the kids signed up to go to Camp Gilead. We want to pay for Camp Gilead this year. We have a, a certain amount of money that we can apply, and uh, I'm, I'm coming to you folks today to see can we even raise that more. Uh, if there's a couple hundred people here and everybody gave $10, there's $2,000 that could go toward the kids for Camp Gilead. We would like to support all the kids that want to go. And that is from, that was it, from third grade all the way up to high school. And so uh, if uh, it's something that you want your kids to be a part of this year, uh, we want to be a part of that. We want to give as much as we can. So if you're willing to help, if you write a check or, or, or give online, just designate it to uh, the missions map slash Camp Gilead and all that money will go for our kids. And, uh, and I can't wait to see how much we can raise, okay? Right now we have enough in there. We could pay for three, four kids, five kids right now. And uh, it'd be really great to take a bus load. If I gotta get a second bus, we'll buy a second bus. Okay, <laughs> we'll rent a second bus, okay? So the, the fact is, if we need transportation, the missions maps wants to be excited about that and we will make it happen. 
Uh, we're also looking at maybe being part of the teaching staff down there, you know, and there's just so much that we can be a part of and we're excited. I'm excited for Kimberly next week to come. Um, really get to know her, folks, because they're an important part of our ministry and we are excited about that. So what does that look like? Scholarships. Kids, be ready. If you want to go to Camp Gilead this year, talk to me, okay? Talk to anyone in the mats. If you've been part of Camp Gilead over the last, how many years you've been here, would you stand up? Anyway, if you've gone to camp, been part of the camp, if you're counselors, if you're, yeah, just think about that, okay? So folks, I mean, look around the room. I mean, this is, these are guys that have been impacted by Camp Gilead, and you could talk to any one of these, and I haven't asked them the permission, but they would give you a, a great uh, support for Camp Gilead, I promise that. So, so I hope we can do it, and thank you very much. It's all yours. All right. Thank you, Ken. Please stand for the reading of God's Word. Be reading from Revelation 4, starting in verse 2. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we continue our worship service, we want to acknowledge that, that you are holy, and each one of us deserve eternal damnation in hell but because of your love and your grace and the gift of your son, now when we trust in him alone for salvation, we can be reunited with you one day in new heavens and new earth. And Lord, thank you so much because we deserve nothing. You have created all things. Everything we have is a gift from you down to the very breath that we're taking right now and all the gifts you've given us on this earth. But none of that compares to what we have in the future because of you. Lord, we love you so much. I just pray that today your spirit be, would be with us. Help us to keep our minds clear and focused on worshiping you. And as we open up your word, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you have for us today. And we want to lift up the rest of this service and we want it to glorify you. So as we continue to sing praises, please be with us, and we love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray.
Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Clothed in rainbows of living color, Ashes of lightning, balls of thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you.
eyes like fire, face like the sun, a voice like thunder, who was and is and is to come. Psalm 86, 15. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Every 
more our sins they are many his mercy is more what riches of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the debt we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more stronger than darkness new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more stronger than darkness new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more our sins they are many his mercy is more our sins they are many his mercy is more grace and peace oh how can this be for lawbreakers and thieves, for the worthless the least. You have said that our judgment is death for all eternity without hope, without rest. Oh, what an amazing mystery, what an amazing mystery, that your grace has come to me. King of all paid the blood price for me. Slaughtered lamb, what atonement you bring. The vilest sinner's heart can be cleansed, can be free. Oh, what an amazing mystery. What an amazing mystery that your grace has come to me. of gratefulness ever rise never cease loved by God and called as a saint my heart is satisfied in the riches of Christ oh what an amazing mystery what an amazing mystery that your grace has come to me. Oh, what an amazing love I see. What an amazing love I see. That your grace has come to me. Oh, what an amazing love I see. What an amazing love I see. That your grace has come to me. Oh, 
what an amazing love I see. What an amazing love I see. That your grace has come to me. Oh, what an amazing love I see. What an amazing love I see. That your grace has come to me. God, we thank you for our time this morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for us to sing uh, about how great you are. Uh, Lord, your love is amazing. It is something that is undeserved by any one of us. And yet, as we think about the cross, as we think about you sending your son to pay a price that he didn't need to pay. He didn't deserve paying it. And yet, in your wisdom, you sent him and he willingly went and he died in our place. Thank you for that example of love. Thank you for what that means for our forgiveness. And it's only through Christ that we get to rest and we get to rejoice and we get to sing and celebrate today. We thank you for all that you are doing. And Jesus, thank you for being a great God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning uh, once again, church. It is great to be here with you today. And uh, again, God has blessed us with a, a beautiful, beautiful weekend so far. <clears throat> I want to start by asking the question, uh, what are you praying about? And obviously that question presupposes that you are praying, that you are seeking the Lord, that you are uh, talking to him, you're engaging in communion with God, but as you consider, what am I praying about? Uh, the topic of prayer is something that we have, again, discussed often here at Christ Fellowship, I feel like especially as of late, and it's been interesting to see different elements kind of converge upon one another uh, in different ministry areas. Uh, I think of noonday prayer that we've tried to start over the last month and a half uh, is an emphasis on how do we pray together in person or if you can't be here remotely on Tuesdays at 12. Uh, this last week, our ladies Bible study in the morning time on Tuesday focused on the spiritual discipline of prayer. Uh, for many years, the Thursday prayer group has met with faithful ladies regularly to seek the Lord. Uh, at our elder meeting Monday night, we spent lengthy time in prayer for you, our, our, our church family. And I think a, a growing recognition of we need to be a praying people. We need to be those who seek the Lord because we need him in our lives and we need him to work. And so again, I want to ask the question, what are you praying about? Um, as I'm recognizing there's all these different areas of ministry and in my own life that prayer is kind of this surfacing spiritual discipline that needs to continue to grow and be fostered. Um, I was on Facebook and my best friend, Ryan Quay, Ryan, I doubt you're watching because you are probably preaching this morning, but Ryan, uh, he is a missionary over in Cambodia and his, his wife, Rebecca, posted something online and uh, they work and they know uh, the author of this book, M.J. Hancock, uh, and he wrote a book called The Pathway to Prayer. And I just got this book about two or three days ago and I started it last night. So there's always a risk of recommending a book before you finished it. But I've looked through the vast majority and it is such an encouragement so far. Um, it has been such a refreshment. The nature of this book is uh, that it's just quotes from Christian authors and theologians, many of which we talk about regularly here at Christ Fellowship. Um, I believe almost every single one of them is referenced in our, our church history hallway. Um, but it's just encouragement after encouragement. How do we grow in prayer? How do we grow in seeking the Lord? And I want to read one quote to you from A.W. Tozer in here. This is from his book, The Pursuit of God. A.W. Tozer writes this, O oh God, I have tasted your goodness, and it has both satisfied me and made me thirsty for more. 
I am painfully conscious of my need of further grace. I am ashamed of my lack of desire. O oh God, the triune God, I want to want you. I long to be filled with longing. I thirst to be made more thirsty still. Show me your glory, I pray you, so that I may know you indeed. I think that's a prayer each of us can resonate with, that we want to want more. We want to long after the Lord more and more and more. And the ministry of prayer in our life, the commitment to seeking the Lord in prayer is vital to that. The title of the sermon this morning is The Prayer of a Servant. And as we read our text this morning, which is Psalm 119, verses 121 through 128, I want to frame this as this is a prayer that the psalmist is writing down for the benefit of you and I, that he is appealing to the Lord in these areas. And this is a prayer that you and I also need to pray. We need to seek the Lord in these for God. Oh, out all of a sudden. There we go. Um, this is an area that we need to, again, bring before the Lord. So as we get going, I'd invite you, would you stand with me as we read our passage this morning? Again, we're in Psalm 119, starting in verse 121. This is what the Word of God says. I have done what is just and right. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Give your servant a pledge of good. Let not the insolent impress, oppress me. My eyes long for your salvation and for the fulfillment of your righteous promise. Deal with your servant according to your steadfast love and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. It is time for the Lord to act, for your law has been broken. Therefore, I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. Therefore, I consider all your precepts to be right. I hate every false way. Lord, as we read that passage, as we think about our, our time before us, we pray that you would bless our time. Holy Spirit, would you open our eyes spiritually, keep them awake physically? Would you... Help our minds to be engaged. Would you help our hearts to be softened? Would you allow the, the text that is your word to speak to us this morning and help us to listen and be changed from it? We thank you and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Again, as I mentioned, this psalm, this section of Psalm 119, is a prayer that we each need to pray to the Lord. This is a prayer that comes from the place of a servant that we bring before God. And so the first movement of prayer that we see in this passage, uh, we are heading at this, that it's a prayer for protection or praying for protection. Well, look again at verses 121 and 22. It says, I have done what is just and right. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Give your servant a pledge of good. Let not the insolent oppress me. So we see here the psalmist is praying again for protection against the oppressor. He's praying that the oppressor would not bring harm to him. That word oppress or the oppressor, the actions that they're doing, this is an abuse of power and authority. It is someone who's taking advantage of others through violence or deceit. This can include being accused. It can include being slandered. Uh, this is somebody who is in a position of authority. They've been given a certain level of power and status and they are preying upon somebody who is weaker than them, who is disenfranchised, who is going through a season of suffering. And the psalmist, whoever this may be, whether it's Daniel, as Pastor Dave has advocated, whether it's David, whether it's someone else, this psalmist is crying out to the Lord that God would deliver him from the oppressor, 
that he would not be left to the, uh, again, poise of the oppressor. And we see that this is something that Israel, the Jewish people, should have been mindful of. If you were to turn to Leviticus 25 and also to Deuteronomy 24, at length, what is described as oppression in Psalm 119 is spelled out in those two texts. And over and over again, the Israelites are told not to do this. This is not how you treat the people around you. This is not how you treat anyone who you are overseeing. And so oppression is very much known by the psalmist and it is told not to be pursued. Now we need to be very careful because even that language of being an oppressor is very common in our culture. That you have people in positions of power and authority and you have those who are weaker and under them and we can pit things against one another and we can get distracted from the reality that oppression does happen. That there are those who, again, God has enabled to have a certain level of authority and they're trying to use that negatively into their advantage and for manipulative reasons to further their own causes. And again, the psalmist, his response to being in this type of situation is to pray. It's to turn and fix his eyes on the Lord. It's to reach out to God. It's not to retaliate. It's not to figure it out under his own direction, under his own guise. And rather, it is to cry out to the Lord in this. Maybe you are here, and if you are honest with yourself, you are in a situation where you feel oppression. There's somebody who is in your life who is arrogant and haughty and prideful, and they are seeking to use their authority and their influence to negatively impact you. And if that's in your position that you are in, how are you handling that? And again, the psalmist is an example that we need to seek the Lord. When he asks for the Lord to deliver him, he asks really on the basis of two things. Uh, The first basis that he asks upon is his own integrity. We see again in verse 121, I have done what is just and right. Do not leave me to my oppressors. So we see the psalmist before the Lord cries out and he says, I am innocent. I am being negatively impacted for this and it's not because of anything that I have done. I have done what is right. Testament. If we were to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 and 21, it says this, 1 Peter 2, 18 says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure... That is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. It's one thing if we are ridiculed, we're defamed, we are slandered because we've done something that is wrong. We've sinned. And what the psalmist is saying here is, That's not the case. He hasn't messed up. He hasn't struggled. He hasn't, uh, again, turned to sin. He hasn't compromised. Rather, he has remained faithful. And just like Peter says in 1, because of that, he is appealing to the Lord, please work on my behalf. We see elsewhere in Scripture that when we give in to sin and we compromise, it impacts our ability to pray and ask the Lord for protection, ask the Lord to intervene for us. We see in Psalm 66, 18, if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. If we willingly do the wrong thing and do injustice, we have no right to appeal to God to intervene for us when we are suffering the consequence of our actions. Rather, again, the psalmist says he has done the just and right thing. 
Even husbands, we see this expressed in Scripture in 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Men, if we are living insensitively, I think that's a word, we're living with a lack of sensitivity towards our wives, our prayers will be hindered. If we knowingly have sin, if we are knowingly doing the wrong thing, our ability to pray and to seek the Lord to intervene on our behalf is going to be hindered. And so the psalmist, he's appealing, he's bringing his request before God because he knows he's done the right thing. He is pursuing justice. Now, this does not mean he's perfect. This does not mean he has not struggled. This does not mean that our only time that we can pray to the Lord is when we've gone a week without sinning. That's not at all how we frame this, but we frame in our understanding of this that if we have sin in our life that we know of, we're choosing not to repent of, our prayer life will absolutely be hindered by that. And rather, if we flip that on the head, if we are seeking obedience, obedience and righteous living, we have boldness to come before God. We have assurance to come before God. We have confidence to come before God. And that's why the psalmist, he comes to the Lord and on the basis of his integrity, he cries out, God, please deliver me from the oppressor. Do not leave me to them. And I would ask just by point of application, What are you praying about? And in your prayer life, is there an element of that that feels empty? Is there an element of your prayer life where you feel like, I am not seeing answer? And then there's a whole number of reasons, but it is important for us to evaluate right at the beginning, is there sin that we know of in our lives that we are not repenting of? And if that is the case, we need to repent of our sin. We need to bring that to Jesus, ask for forgiveness, choose through his strength to turn away and to pursue righteousness. And when we've done that, not only are we forgiven, but there is a liberation that comes from that. There's a freedom that comes when we know I have nothing to hide. I have nothing to keep suppressed. I can walk joyfully in the straight path because I know my sins are confessed before the Lord and I am pursuing what is just and right. The second basis for why the psalmist is praying to the Lord and why he's seeking protection is found in verse 22. It says, Give your servant a pledge of good. Let not the insolent oppress me. I would say that the the capability of God himself is the basis for why he is praying. I love how the NASB translates verse 22. Rather than saying, give your servant a pledge of good, in the NASB it says, be surety for your servant for good. I think of Kyle, because this is very much kind of real estate language. The terminology for surety almost has kind of a mortgage mentality. What are you going to assure? What are you going to sign? How are you going to obligate yourself so that we know this is going to happen? And what the psalmist is crying out to is, God, would you assure me that you're going to do good to me? Would you assure me, can I guarantee, can I bank on this so that when I'm facing this oppression, I'm facing this hardship, I know God's purpose is for my good? That's at the heart of what is being said here. If we were to go to Genesis 43 and 44, again, if you did the five-day reading plan, we've been past Genesis for a while, but this is the story of Joseph. So Genesis 37 through 50 is the story of Joseph's life, and we get to chapter 43 and 44. Joseph has already been taken captive down into Egypt. He's already been brought up, and he is now serving as second in command under Pharaoh. And it's when his brothers, the same ones who had sent him into captivity, now make their way down to Egypt to seek aid and assistance. And it's in that story that Joseph finds out that he has his brother 
Benjamin, who's younger than him. And he is wanting to keep Benjamin there, but the one condition that Jacob, their father, allowed Benjamin to go down to Egypt for in the first place was if Benjamin was protected. And when Joseph sees Benjamin, he wants to keep him in the house until he can verify, obviously he knows, but until he can verify all that these 12 brothers, these 11 brothers are communicating. And as he does that, the brother Judah steps in. And Judah, in chapters 43 and 44, says, let me take Benjamin's place. If you need assurance that we are keeping our word, that we are doing what we say that we are, that our story is truthful, don't keep Benjamin. Take me instead. And Judah, that word for surety, functions as the surety in this situation. He is the guarantee to Joseph that he that they are doing what they are supposed to be doing, that they are being faithful to the story that they've presented. And the best example of this is, how do we know, again, that God truly loves us? How do we know that God truly forgives us of our sins? How do we know that we can have hope? How do we know when we fill in all of those questions that are the most critical and vital questions And Jesus Christ is the surety of that. How do we know God intends to do good to us? It's through sending his son, Jesus. How do we know that God and his purposes are always for our betterment? It is through the gospel message that he would send his very own son to forgive our sins and to give us new life through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. And so as we think about this passage The psalmist, in his oppression, appeals to the Lord, give your servant a pledge of good. What is it that you guarantee? And we know the ultimate conclusion of that is that Jesus is that pledge for you and I. So as the hardship and the oppression and the difficulty you are facing, again, I want to ask you, where are you turning in the midst of that? To whom are you looking? How are you handling that? And once again, if we want to see growth and see fruitfulness in our lives, where we need to turn is we need to pray to God and seek his protection. The second area of prayer that we see in this passage is really a prayer for growth. Uh, Look with me at verses 123 through 25. Verse 123, it says, My eyes long for your salvation and for the fulfillment of your righteous promise. Deal with your servant according to your steadfast love and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. Are we praying that we would grow in our faith? Are we praying that we would every day be conformed, be made more and more to look like, to act like, to think like, and to be in our character more and more like Jesus. Is that a part of your prayer life? Is that what we are seeking collectively as a church? And we see in this, each of these verses, I think, gives an aspect of how we are to pray towards growth. And the first area of that is in our prayer for growth, we need to pray that our desires and our longings would be Godward oriented. That they would be Godward oriented. Again, verse 123, it says, My eyes long for salvation and for the fulfillment of your righteous promise. Again, as the psalmist is experiencing this impression, as he's experiencing suffering, he is longing for deliverance from that and that God would fulfill his promises to him. In the NASB, instead of saying, uh, again, my eyes long for your salvation, it translates, my eyes fail with longing for salvation. And the phraseology of that's interesting because what it has and what we take away from that is the psalmist for a long time has had his eyes fixed on God for deliverance. And he is almost communicating, he's being honest and humble enough to say, my eyes have almost failed me. 
I'm almost ready to give up, but I'm resolved that I will keep my eyes on the Lord. There's this expectation, this anticipation that even though this has been hard, even though this has been a long, hard, difficult season, I will not give up from that. Instead, I will keep my eyes longing for this deliverance. You think of what's the last thing that you have had to wait for? Maybe as a family you've planned a trip or there's something that you've just been looking forward to and you're just counting down day after day after day. You cannot wait for that thing to get here. We think about that and we intensify that that much more that when we are going through suffering and oppression, we long to be free from that situation. We long to overcome that and our eyes need to be resolute in fixing them on the Lord. Perhaps when he's thinking about, again, the promise of God's deliverance of the salvation from the situation, there's a number of promises that perhaps came to mind. We think of Exodus 6 6 and 7, it says, Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from slavery to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. As the psalmist is anchoring himself on the promise of God to deliver, that very well could be in the forefront of his mind. We think of Psalm 32 verse 7, you are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Psalm 34, 4, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fear. Psalm 34, 17, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. When we experience this oppression, this distress, this suffering, And we long to be freed from that. We long for that situation to be resolved. Where are we anchoring ourselves to? And the psalmist is a wonderful example that his anchor, where he is going to, is in his longing and his desire for deliverance, his focus is on God, not on himself and not on his circumstance. The second area we see here of a a prayer for growth is that we would have teachable hearts shaped by the love of God. Look at verse 124. It says, Deal with your servant according to your steadfast love and teach me your statutes. Aren't you grateful that God is the best teacher? That he is gentle and lowly in how he deals with us. That he is patient and gracious. For all of our parents out there, when you are instructing your kids and you've done this for the 37th time that day, aren't you glad that God is gracious and he's patient? And as we read this, we recognize that the psalmist is crying out, deal with me according to your steadfast love. My love would know an end and my patience, impatience would creep in very quickly. The steadfast love of God, it's part of who God is and how he deals with us, how he teaches us is framed under that context. I want to key in though on that line that teach me your statutes. I would argue as we are praying for growth, as we're praying that we would be more and more like Christ, being teachable is a major part of that. In fact, if you are not teachable, you will not grow. If you are not teachable, you will not grow. And so as we think about that and unpack that, one of the main conditions to have a teachable heart is that we need to be humble. We need to be contrite over our sin. We need to have a spirit that recognizes we do not know everything. 
I know a lot of very intelligent people, and there's times where I think, maybe I've got this area pretty well figured out, but if any of us, any of us ever think to ourselves, I don't continue need, I do not need to continue to learn more and more in any area, woe to us in that moment. If we feel like I've learned this, and I learned this 20 years ago, and I never need to assess or reassess what I've been taught, what I've learned, and we are just rigid to the degree that we are not ever willing to go back to the Word of God and with fresh eyes say, what does God have to say about this? Woe to us. We have to be teachable. Not only do we need to have a humble and contrite heart in order to be teachable, in order for God to help us understand and learn what his statutes are, the right framework needs to be had in that. I want to talk for just a a moment, you can put the picture up there, about really a a very, I would argue, popular movement in our culture. And students, really, I want to focus on you, and if you're a, what's after millennials? Is it Gen Z or Gen X? Probably Gen Z, because that's later in the alphabet. But anyway, so... Uh, the whole concept of deconstruction. If you search that, if you see on Facebook, if you follow influencers in any capacity, uh, there's a growing movement, and often it's in the church itself, of people deconstructing their faith. And at the heart and the core of that, and let me be very clear off the bat, I am not advocating for this. In fact, I'm saying we have to guard greatly against this. At the heart of that really is this appeal to question everything. Question everything they've been taught. Question everything that they have learned. Question things that they often have viewed as normative in their belief system. Uh, And it's to, again, reassess with a new lens, a new viewpoint, what it is that they believe. Now, often what's at the core of this deconstruction is a presupposition of humanism. It's a presupposition to say, I, now that I've gotten older, now that I am wiser, now that I know more, now that I've heard more and read more and watched more, need to come at it and look at it from my understanding and need to gain a new perspective and a new belief system and structure based off of that. The contrast of that and what I think is critical for us, if we are to be teachable, we need to do a lot of the same things, but we come at it from a completely different foundation. We come at it from a place of it is a healthy and good thing to regularly go back and say, why do I believe what I believe? Why do I hold as truthful the things that are truthful? Why do I believe when the Bible says this about who God is, that that is actually something that I can cling to and hold on to? We need to question. We need to evaluate what we believe about a whole range of issues. What do we believe about keeping the Sabbath? What do we believe about spiritual gifts? What do we believe about baptism? What do we believe about stewardship? What do we believe about who God is? What do we believe about sin? What do we believe about anything and everything? We need to evaluate and we need, above all of that, to be taught by God. When I was preparing for this, there was a tension that I felt of, as a pastor, do I want to give the encouragement to assess your beliefs? Because as a parent, maybe you're in here and you're thinking, do I want my kids to evaluate what they've been taught all growing up? Do I want my kids to come to that place of thinking, well, why would I believe that the Bible's true? Why would I believe that God is who he said he is? Why would I question any of those things? But here's the point. If we are intentional to recognize this is the authoritative word of God and we want to grow in our faithfulness and in our trust of the truthfulness of it, there's nothing that we should be afraid to question. 
Because if we are pursuing the truth under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, God will lead us to the truth. If we go back to always asking, what does God say about this? I've heard this all growing up. This is what has always been taught to me. What does the Bible say about this? And if that is our place that we go to and we find, again, our beliefs off of Scripture, not off of our human understanding, not off of what we think is right, not off of what we desire it to be, but based off what the Bible says, that is a healthy way to grow and learn. And we need to be teachable. We do not hold our beliefs because we've grown up with those beliefs. We do not hold our beliefs because our parents told us to believe them. We do not hold our beliefs because it's what culture says or it's popular. We hold our beliefs because God has communicated what we are to believe. And the only way we know what that is is through his word. And so church, I encourage you, if you are at a place, if you're honest, I've heard this. I don't really know why I believe what I believe. Go to the Word of God. Go to the Bible. Ask that question, God, what do you say about this? And we will grow and learn. And again, I trust in God's guidance and His goodness. If our desire genuinely is that I am convinced of what I believe and I'm going to pursue the truth and we are going to the Word of God for that, God will strengthen and deepen our faith as a result of that. Now, here's the the difference in this. If we are not humble, if we are not teachable, we will never do any of that. If we're not willing to say, you know what? It has been a long time since I have ever assessed this. I need to grow in this area. I'm going to go to the Word of God. I'm going to study. I'm going to read. I'm going to meditate. If we are not willing to do that and we say, I know what I believe. I know I have it completely figured out. I know what I know, and there's nothing that anyone could say that's going to change that. That's where there's pride that needs to be addressed. That's where we want to be a teachable, humble people. The last area of growth that we see the psalmist praying about is found in verse 125. He says this, I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. Really, this is a prayer for us. It's a prayer that the psalmist gives that we would live out our identity. If you noticed in verse 22, uh, in verse 24, and in verse 25, the psalmist, and this is why we have the title of the sermon that it is, attributes himself, he identifies himself as a servant. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimony. When we think of being servants, when we think of this is who we are, this is what God has communicated to us, this is our identity, I want to encourage us to think, what does that mean to live the Christian life with that understanding, I am a servant. That is who I am. And I I would argue that changes dramatically how we live and a couple implications that come from that. The the first is just this, I'm not the master. If I'm the servant, I am not the master. I am not the one who's in charge. I am not the final authority. I'm not the one who issues the direction and instruction and what I do with my time and my resources and whatever that may be. Rather, the master who is God himself is the one who dictates what that looks like in my life. I am the servant to the Lord Jesus. And so as we frame how we are to live and as we seek to grow in the Christian faith, we need to press more and more into that idea that we are not the ones who are in charge. We are not the ones who have the right to do anything and everything that we would want. Contrary to our culture, We are not the ones in charge of our own bodies. We are not in charge of our own resources. We are not autonomous. We're not the captain of our own souls. We are under the authority of the king. And that king is Jesus Christ. And so again, my question is, how are we doing at fleshing out, at living out that identity as being a servant? 
what he says here, I am your servant, give me your understanding. Again, having a posture of humility before the Lord is critical if we are to grow in the Christian faith. Have you thought about this? How much of your life, of my life, would change if every choice was framed under that idea that I am a servant of the Lord Jesus? So instead of just doing and acting and thinking and speaking, we press into, we wear that mantle of servanthood as our primary identity, that I am not the one who's in charge. Jesus is my Lord, and if he is my Lord, how does he want me to live this life? If every choice was not made until we first evaluated it under that lens, how different would our lives be? The last area we see here, not only has the psalmist again prayed for protection as he experiences oppression, he's prayed for growth, again, that his longings and desires would be God-centered, that he would be teachable, that he would live out his identity as a servant. But we also see now that he is praying for justice. In verse 126, it says, It is time for the Lord to act, for the law has been broken. Therefore, I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. Therefore, I consider all your precepts to be right. I hate every false way. It's interesting that... uh, The psalmist is very bold and assertive in his statement. He says, it is time for the Lord to act. There's a recognition that things are not going well. God needs to step in, and I would agree, I think we could all agree, in 2024, would we say things are going well, or there's a little bit of a steady decline that we see in the world around us? There are terrible things happening regularly all around us. There's oppression and evil that is rampant. There's many things that we could point to. And if we're honest with the psalmist, we would also cry out, God, would you step in? Would you intervene? Would you act and stop this evil from continuing? And we say that not supposing that we know better than God, but we say that because, Lord, we don't want to see this evil anymore. We don't want to see this suffering anymore. And yet it's very interesting because the psalmist, when he cries out to the Lord in this, it has nothing to do with him. Instead, look at the reason why he cries out in that way. He says, it is time for the Lord to act for your law has been broken. He wants God to step in and act because the word of God is being violated. The word of God is being broken. It is not being kept. It is being mocked. It is, again, being discarded right and left. And I think what we see here is the psalmist in his appeal to God to do justice, to step in and intervene, to make right what has been wrong. He does it off the basis that he wants God to be glorified. He wants God's word to be kept, which is going to bring the utmost honor to the Lord. And so as we seek the Lord for justice, this is a good sanctifying question, even as we think about, God, would you step in? Are we asking God to step in to the injustices we see around us for reasons that we selfishly desire or for reasons that are going to bring glory to God? And our appeal for God to be a God of justice, which he is, and to act and intervene, again, are we doing that on the basis we want God to be glorified? We want his word to be kept. We see right after that, that as a result of this, as he's thinking in terms of, I love the word of God, and yet it's being broken, and God is being defamed as a result of that. Therefore, the connection point of that. He says, I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. It's interesting when we hold the word of God in a high regard to when it is broken, 
we realize this is evil and wicked. I want God to stop that. I want to see God's word be kept and affirmed and glorified. When we hold it in that high regard, it does something to our affections. It does something to our very hearts. And we see really in the last two verses, there is a jealousy, a sanctified jealousy for the word of God. We see, first of all, again, that the psalmist, he loves the commandments of God above gold, even fine gold. Again, in his longings and what he cherishes, he cherishes the word of God more than riches, more than anything else. In verse 128, on the flip side of that, not only does it impact his loves, it impacts what he hates. It says, therefore, I consider all your precepts to be right. I hate every false way. Again, the word for hate is such a a strong descriptive term, but when we hold the word of God in high regard and when we recognize it as being broken, our hatreds have to be directed appropriately. And the psalmist, again, is adamant. He hates every false way. Some of you know, several weeks back, uh, my family got to go down to Oregon and got to visit a lot of our old uh, friends and some of our family members as well and uh, had a conversation with uh, one of my friends down there named Tim. And Tim asked me the question as he knows that we're going through Psalm 119. He thought, his two comments were, that's really cool. I haven't heard of a church going through Psalm 119. And his other comment, which Pastor Dave has had the same experience with, is, doesn't that get kind of redundant or boring or a little bit old after a while? Because you're kind of saying the same thing over and over and over again. And we dialogued about it. And my takeaway from that, and even as Pastor Dave has made the same comment that he's heard before as well, is... Until our hearts are changed by the word of God. To the degree that our hates are purified, our loves are purified, our longings and desires are pointed to where they need to be. We are seeking the Lord first and foremost when we go through suffering, when we go through oppression. We're humble, teachable people. Until we've grown in all of those areas, we still need to hear what the word of God says. We still need to hear what Psalm 119 has to teach us. And I don't know about you, I still need to grow in all of those areas. I still need to glean what the Word of God has to say in all of those areas. As we close, I want to again ask you, what are you praying about? If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a servant of Jesus Christ, And my encouragement would be, are you seeking the Lord in the midst of hardship, in the midst of oppression, whatever the difficult circumstance may be? Is your eyes focused upward on the Lord or are they focused horizontal on the problem itself? Are you praying for growth? That the areas of your heart that need to be conformed to be like Jesus would in fact be conformed and you would seek him and be humble and teachable in the injustices around us, are we seeking God's intervention and pursuing his timing and resting in him? Would you pray with me? Uh, Lord, we thank you again for our time today. Thank you for your word. And Lord, there's so many areas that we all need to grow in. There's so many areas, Lord, that we need your help and your grace. Uh, So I pray that you would do a great work in us. Um, And again, Lord, that we would be a church that prays. We would be a church that constantly seeks you and our understanding of how much we are dependent upon you would show itself in our prayer lives. That we would come to you empty-handed and a needy people. And even as we read from Tozer earlier, what we would desire and want and long more and more and more for you because no one is greater than you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Take the
the world but give me jesus all its joys are but a name but his love abides forever through eternal years the same take the world but give me jesus sweetest comfort of my soul with my savior watching over me i can sing though billows roll oh the height and depth of mercy oh the length and breadth of love oh the fullness of redemption pledge of endless life above take this world my God's enough. Take the world, but give me Jesus. In his cross, my trust shall be. Till with clearer, brighter vision, face to face, my Lord I the length and breadth of love, oh, the fullness of redemption, pledge of endless life above, take this world, my God, enough. Take this world, take this world. And give me Jesus in his cross, my trust shall be. Take this world and give me Jesus till that day, my Lord, I see. Take this world and give me Jesus in his cross, my trust shall be. Take this world and give me Jesus till that day, my Lord, I see. Oh, the height and depth of mercy, oh, the length and breadth of love, oh, the fullness of redemption, pledge of endless life above. Pledge of endless life above. Take this world, my God's enough. Take this world, my God's enough. I want to end with another prayer, and my hope is that our eyes would leave safely looking upward for the rest of our day and this week. Uh, this is Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. It says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. You are dismissed. Did you try?